So I wanted to explore again a little bit this idea of inquiry or questioning. I talked a little bit about it last week, and I'd like to explore it a little bit more. Some of you might be familiar with the story of the Kalamas. It's a group of people that had a lot of um, spiritual teachers coming through at the time of the Buddha. And then when the Buddha is in the neighborhood, they asked him, well, you know, there's all these different teachers coming through. Who should we believe? Who's telling the truth? And rather than um, just the Buddha saying, well, I'm the one that's telling the truth. You should believe me. Instead of saying that, he encourages them to question. He encourages them to have an inquiry. There's a few things that he says, and one of them, the primary ones, is to ask these questions. Does this lead to welfare and happiness? If yes, then live in accordance with it. Does this lead to welfare and happiness? And then another question is, does this lead to harm and suffering? And if yes, then to abandon it. So to pay some attention to um, what they're doing, what they're saying, what they're thinking, including their um, inner life, you know, their inner mental events, including the intentions. And so we can do the same. Is what we're doing, does this lead to welfare and happiness? Are my intentions that are underneath my behavior, that are underneath what I'm saying, are they such that I, they come out of a sense of I want to be right? Or maybe they come out of a sense of I want to be seen in a particular way. I want to be seen as a smart person. Or are our intentions coming out of compassion and care and trying to do the right thing for ourselves and others? So not only do we pay attention to what we're doing and our speech and our inner mental life and our intentions, but we also pay attention to the consequences. Is what we're doing lead to happiness? Is what we're doing lead to greater suffering and harm? So this type of inquiry requires that we're connected to our experiences that we are paying attention and that we're noticing. Not that we have to have um, this question like, is this right? But the question of what is happening? What is, um, what, what are the consequences? With a, with a spirit of discovery or um, maybe like a research scientist or, okay, so I did this and then what happened? What were the consequences of this? In some ways, um, when I was a research scientist, I used to love this part. This was one of my favorite parts, actually, is to have a question about how does does this work, or is this, uh, what's the role of this particular factor or element? And then to be able to go into the laboratory and test it. You know, to have the skills and to have the resources to be able to do that, to have a question and to go in and test it. And I think that the that Buddhism kind of encourages this um, research scientist or being a naturalist, for example, just observing. It's part of what makes uh, Buddhism compelling. So rather than this idea that we have to uh, believe, that we have to adopt a particular credo, or that we have to adopt a particular um, way of viewing everything or interpreting everything, instead this encouragement to, well, to see what's underneath the actions, what are the consequences of our actions. So the teachings really ask for us to have a listening heart in some kind of way, to have a wise heart, to have a wise mind, and a mind that pays attention 
accept what is happening as opposed to taking on and maybe wearing the cloak of um, particular beliefs or or this instead there's just an encouragement for us to see for ourselves whether rather than an insist insisting that we believe something so with this practice i mean practices are offered and understandings are pointed to with the invitation to see if this matches your experience. See if this is how things unfold in your experience. What happens when you do this? What happens when you don't do this? So when we sit to meditate, it isn't so much that we're trying to make something happen. How many times have you done this, tried to sit and try to make something happen? And of course, it doesn't quite work that way. As was pointed out in the guided meditation, the we don't get to control what our experiences are. We don't get to control what's happening. We don't get to make it happen. When we sit down and meditate, we notice. And there's a little bit of a spirit of inquiry of what's happening now. What's happening now? And what's happening now? So can we listen? Listen, can we have a question with the spirit of curiosity or rather than trying to confirm something that we already know, rather than to have this confirmation bias of like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I know this, I just gotta see this and I just have to, oh, not like, not really paying attention, but kind of like a check mark, like, oh, okay, there was an in-breath, that's good enough. Oh, yeah, okay, there was a sound, that's good enough. <laughs> kind of this um, you know, way that's not really intimate with our experience, but uh, maybe kind of like trivializes our experience. But instead, can we have this spirit of curiosity? And so... Might, we might ask ourselves, well, what kind of what, what blocks some of this questioning? Either these big questions or the question of what's happening right now. And some of it might be that there's an inner critic that kind of shows up uh, really loud and feels authoritative. And it's asking this question, am I getting it right? Is, that, is, this, is this the experience I'm supposed to be having? Is this right? And so it doesn't really allow us to kind of relax into our experience. Instead, it has kind of like a deadening effect on our practice. This if we're always wondering or worried whether, am I getting it right? Or maybe the inner critic um, is, has something comes in the flavor like this. Well, who am I to question this? Whether it's a teaching, whether it's an experience, Maybe whether it's an insight, where there might be a small little voice that thinks, oh, we just have to accept it. Just believe it. We don't feel like, well, who am I? I'm, maybe I'm not worthwhile to uh, question these things. Or maybe the flip side of that is also like, well, surely others know more than I do. I just have to adopt the beliefs that others do. So this this um, trusting of authority, as opposed to in an open-hearted, warm-hearted way, having some questioning of authority. Again, kind of um, getting back to some of the days when I was a research scientist, I remember that um, I had this uh, job during the summer, my very first summer after college, and I was a lab assistant. And there was uh, somebody that was in the lab across the hall that was supposed to be some um, well-known scientist and that was um, supposed to, you know, you know, now I don't remember all the particulars, but I remember thinking like, oh, okay, 
he's supposed to be a you know a really well-known scientist and I remember that he drove this uh, really beat-up car it was like a wonder that this car could uh, move at all right it was just I had clearly seen better days and on this car was this beautiful clean new bumper sticker that looked really out of place with this uh, poor beat-up car and this bumper sticker said question authority at the time, I thought, why would this really well-known authoritative scientist have a, this bumper sticker question authority? At the time, that wasn't clear to me. When I was, you know, such a young person, right, the, just starting college. But later, I realized, oh, this is what made him such a great scientist. This just having this this uh, openness, this willingness to question. So when it's Buddhist practitioner, practitioners, we're not scientists necessarily, but it's this still kind of this uh, spirit of not just passively accepting, but having some, having some curiosity about. So this might not be, maybe for some people it comes naturally, maybe for some people it's, does it doesn't come so easily or readily or feels uncomfortable or foreign. In some ways, we live in a culture that in a certain way prides itself on its independence and the pioneering spirit. But in another way, there's an awful lot in our culture that is beholden to authority in different ways. For example, like the media often tells us things to inform us in an entertaining way. Of course they do. This is their job and that we need the media and it's great that they do this. But sometimes if it's done in such an entertaining way, it might discourage us from being engaged with it or thinking about what was just told or that was, um, what did we just hear and what did we not hear or something like this kind of, it becomes more like just something that we sink into and don't really stay awake for. So uh, Jack Cornfield tells this story. And there's a few elements in this talk that are inspired from um, some things that Jack has said in Dharma talks. But one is that he tells this story of this uh, principal. And she had in her life this wish to do more service. So a few days a week, she began to make sandwiches, you know, after the school was finished in the, in the afternoons. And she had this pleasure of um, d- doing service and giving these sandwiches to the homeless. And she would give them to the homeless and she didn't care if she was thanked or she didn't care if the homeless refused them. She wasn't doing that this to be liked. It just was her, this um, calling in her heart that she wanted to be of service to others in this particular way. And it felt like the right thing for her to do at this time in her life is what she was doing. So she was a couple times a week making sandwiches and bringing them to where the homeless people were. Then the media found out and she became kind of a minor celebrity in her area. And Inspired by her work, other teachers and other people around her began to send her money for her ministry. And to their surprise, they all received their money back and with a short note that read, make your own damn sandwiches. (laughs) I don't know why I always laugh when I think this, make your own damn sandwiches. Right, this encouragement, you know, and to um, feel in what is the, how do, what does the, if we have a call for service, what, uh, what does that sound like? What is it calling to do? Maybe service isn't what's being called to for us, but um, this encouragement, not th- that, that, that we have to do our work ourselves. We have to be engaged. We have to kind of lean in in some kind of way and, and that we can become more wise or more loving or whatever it is we would like our spiritual practice to do for us simply by taking on that outer costume or sitting in a particular way or 
adopting some type of language or any type of exterior imitation. And to ask questions, to have an inquiry is a way in which we can lean in and really be involved with it as opposed to just be on the exterior, making our own damn sandwiches. But maybe there's some pressure to not ask some questions or have just some of this inquiries because, of course, we want to have answers. Not necessarily questions, we want to have answers. We believe that having answers will protect us or provide some security or make us um, have some more confidence or worry less. Or, But the truth is, we don't know the future. Nobody really knows the future. And maybe uh, this year, 2020, I don't think anybody predicted certainly that this year was going to happen this way. So the truth is that we don't know the future. So there's this uh, story at the time of the Buddha that's um, Malunkya Putta is a monk under the Buddha. And he goes to the Buddha and says, I'm going to disrobe. I'm going to leave the monastic order. I'm no longer going to be one of your disciples unless you answer some of these questions. And he has a number of questions kind of metaphysical questions. And the Buddha replied, well, I never promised you that I was ever going to give you the answers to all these questions. And Malunkya Putta agrees that, okay, yeah, that wasn't a part of the deal. The Buddha never promised that. But some of the question, one of the question was that Malunkya Putta asked is, what happens after you die? What happens after you die? And the Buddha refused to answer this question. Refused to answer and and he said, well, to answer this question is not beneficial. It doesn't lead to peace. It doesn't, won't support um, insight or awakening. So just similar to like how he gave the question to the Kalamas of, does this lead to welfare and happiness, or does this lead to suffering? The Buddha is pointing to, well, some types of questions, even though there's a spirit of inquiry, some types of questions shouldn't be answered. They don't lead to welfare and happiness. They aren't beneficial. They don't lead to insight and peace and awakening. So then the, after he'd given this little talk to Malunkya Bhutta, the Buddha then gives this little simile of the poisoned arrow. So suppose that you're shot by a poisoned arrow and then the, um, your friends and relatives um, d- learn that you've been shot by this poisoned arrow and they run to go get the doctor to help you. And they bring the doctor back and before the doctor can remove the arrow and um, help you, before that you insist on asking, well, who shot the arrow? Where does that person live? What does that person look like? What type of feather was on the shaft of the, fe- of the arrow? What was the shaft of the arrow made out of? What was the arrowhead of that arrow made out of? What was the bow string that was on the bow that shot the arrow made out of? Right, all these questions. And by the time it took to answer all these questions, the person would have died, having been shot with a poisoned arrow. So in this way, there's a spirit of inquiry, but to notice, to kind of keep in mind that which questions are worthwhile to answering, which ones are not. Instead, that the, this, um, this practice of questioning is to help us to see for ourselves. Help us to see for ourselves. And in some ways, to see for ourselves is the Dharma. Is to be connected to the Dharma, is to be experiencing the Dharma. There's a number of ways in which we might understand Dharma, but um, one way it is described as the Dharma is visible here and now, 
something that we see. It's immediate and it's inviting to be seen for oneself. It's onward leading and to be personally realized. So this way of questioning is a way in which for us to connect with the Dharma, which also we could understand is just the the flow of how things go, the conditions, this kind of like flowing nature of uh, all experiences, uh, all arisings and passings away. There's a number of different ways we might understand the the Dharma, but to help us we can understand the teachings and what is the Dharma, we can ask big questions. For example, what is it that opens the heart? What is it that opens the mind? How can we live in such a way, how can we practice in such a way that our hearts and our minds are open? In a way that is onward leading and leads to peace and freedom that leads to greater and greater ease. And can we live from this place of love and freedom? How can we live from a place of love and freedom, love and wisdom? Sometimes it's easy to see the roots of fear or confusion or greed and hatred and seeing how that's playing out in the world. But can we see also how the roots of love and care and the roots of wisdom also can be playing out in the world? And is this something that we can tap into and trust and use to guide our guide our actions, our speech and how we show up in the world? So these roots of love how deep are they in us and can we trust them? Can we have this inquiry, have this type of question? To explore, to take some time to investigate. Or we might ask a question, how might I live in the freest way possible with the most amount of freedom, true freedom? So we train our hearts and minds with meditation practice in order that we might face fear and confusion or allow joy to grow in us, allow some happiness and well-being to grow in us. And we so with our meditation practice, we might have tastes of freedom, might have tastes of contentment, we might have tastes of well-being. And how can we live with letting that to guide us, having those tastes of freedom to come from those places? Because if we don't live from those places, then it's just a memory that we had those experiences. But instead, can we use it to guide how we are in this, in our daily life and how we're showing up? Of course, we can have this inquiry of, who am I? Kind of in a deep sense. What is this? What is this experience? Who is it that is doing this inquiry? Who is creating these ideas? And who is it that is telling these stories? We can ask these types of questions. So what would it take for you to be able to answer these questions? Maybe it would take some loving kindness practice. Some people will like say that for a year they'll do loving kindness practice steadily as a way to kind of open their hearts and learn the questions of how to live from a place of love. Maybe you could simplify your life and whatever way that means, literally or figuratively. I recently moved and I noticed that right when we move, we organize our things and get rid of things that we no longer need. And I'm just noticing that having more 
freedom in terms of having less items just makes more room for more freedom. Simplifying really has had an impact in a really nice way. So maybe that's something that might support you to answer some of these deep questions. Or maybe to do some service. To make some damn sandwiches. <laughs> and whatever way, you know, you interpret that or, or what in what way that works out for you. Or maybe to do some deep reflection practice, sometimes to drop in some of these questions during your meditation. So there are some things that we do know that the Buddha was pointing to and that our experience tells us. That is, that things are changing. They're inconstant. They are not always, they are not stable. They are not permanent. And this change may be subtle or it might be obvious, but they're always changing. We know that clinging, holding on, is, doesn't work. Especially when things are changing. You get kind of a rope burn, this expression, as things are sliding through and we're holding on really tight. We know this. We know that Things, experiences only arise when the conditions are in place for them to arise. And we can work with conditions and and when things, when there, there is cause and effect and when something is causing something to arise, if that cause is no longer there, then that will no longer arise. So there are some things that we know or maybe we don't know, maybe the Buddha is pointing to these, and it's worthwhile for us to investigate these things too. But freedom is possible. As a freedom of knowing that even though problems arise, even though difficulties arise, and we can get caught up with our fears and our confusion and the sense of problems and But yes, to recognize that this is not who I am. This is not what I am. And this possibility is in your heart, is in your mind, is in just as much as it is in everybody else's. Just as much as it is in anybody else's. And it is for all of us to discover. All of us to have this inquiry and to discover the way that freedom might show up and the way that we might live from this freedom. Thank you.